Today, we'll chat all about my October group trip to Disneyland. That's coming up on this episode 380 of WW Prep to Go. Hello and welcome to WW Prep to Go, where we talk strategy and ideas for people planning their Disney World trips. I am your host, Shannon Albert from WDWPrepSchool.com. Thank you for being here for episode 380. Today's episode is all about Disneyland. I have said here many times if I could convince Disney World people to visit Disneyland, I will consider it a big goal accomplished. And on this trip, I had a chance to do that with lots of first timers. And so that was very gratifying. I'll get into the details of that in just a moment. As always, a reminder to follow on social media so you can stay connected to the news, interact with us. We do Q and A's on both Facebook and Instagram on a regular basis. So if you'd like to participate, that is the best place to head. And we'll look forward to chatting with you there. I can always tell by the questions asked during the Q and A that people are from the podcast because there are so many things that I talk about here and nowhere else. So I see you when you show up and I appreciate that connection to make it a two-way street instead of just me talking at you. So I wanted to talk about our Disneyland trip because it was kind of a logistical challenge, opportunity, because we had a group of 34 people going on this trip. This is the group that we travel with every year. We went on a Disney cruise last year. It was also Halloween time. The year before, we did the 50th at Disney World together. Next year, we're going to do another cruise. So this time, it just happened to be Disneyland. So a lot of people came because the pricing on Disneyland trips is much more accessible than like Disney cruises often are. And people could kind of come in and out for the number of days they had available for work, unlike a cruise, which is obviously a set itinerary, doesn't allow people to come and go. And so we had a really big turnout. Among the group are Disneyland pros who know exactly what they're doing and first timers. So I was, of course, very excited about the first timers because I wanted them to fall in love with the place that I love so much. A lot of people have When I talk like this, they'll say, are you sure you don't want to run a Disneyland website? You talk about it so much. I really, really do love Disneyland, but it does not scratch the planning itch the way that Disney World does. So to me, they kind of serve different purposes. Disneyland's much more laid back. So if you find yourself frustrated by how much planning is involved with Disney World, Disneyland might be a good alternative. But if you love the planning part, Disney World is definitely going to give you more of that. So I don't really like to pick you know, which one's favorite, because to me, they serve different purposes. But I definitely, definitely love Disneyland. And one of the reasons I am passionate about converting people into going is that it I feel like it took me way too long to be convinced. I was like, it's smaller. Why would I care about that? I get to go to Disney World. I'm right in the middle of both. So why wouldn't I pick the one that is bigger? And the truth is, Disneyland is its own thing and has some very unique offerings and and perks that Disney World does not. And so If you're privileged enough to get to do both, then I would highly suggest doing that. I know a lot of people that listen to this are in the eastern part of the United States because that is who goes to Disney World. So a flight out to California can be quite long. For those of us that are in the middle, it's a little bit easier um, navigation to go to either because we're just like two and a half, three hours from either one. So it is easier. I recognize the challenges of being on the East Coast, but if you can go, I would highly suggest it. Anyway, we had a group of 34. And although lots of people did their own planning and and elements of the trip, I was kind of the the central person that organized it, starting with the hotel, Um, Anaheim Hotel, which is where we have stayed many times, and I've talked about it on here, is the hotel that we chose for this trip, both because it uh, has accessible pricing. I think our rate was like $200 a night, which is the group rate. It wasn't the public rec rate. Um, So that made it easy to fit into the budgets of lots of people, but also it is right across the street from Disneyland. It also has big spaces where groups can gather. And that was a big factor for us because we did have so many people. And one night we all met in the lobby and had pizza and drinks because there's a pizza press connected to it. So that's easy to do. The pool itself is huge. So if we had went to go out there, the pool we could have. There's also outdoor spaces with seating. 
So it was really good for many reasons for a group. In order to book it, I called the Anaheim Hotel directly and I got a contract with them. At Disney hotels, you have to have have a travel agency to work with their groups. But in this case, you don't. Um, I just did it as an individual. And I was able to like eight or nine months in advance, lock in a certain number of rooms at a rate that ended up being much less than the public or rack rate. And the only downside to this is that all the money then has to come from me. And I bared the financial responsibility if we didn't fill the rooms enough that I had locked in. So I think I secured, I think I told them, let's do 17 rooms as part of the block. And I think we use 16, which was enough for the contract. But if, for instance, lots of people had canceled, then I would have had to deal with the consequence of that because that is how the contract worked. And then when it came time to pay for the rooms, all the money had to come from me. So I had to collect the money from everyone and um, make sure that the tab, which is like $15,000 total, got paid. So just some logistic things to figure out there. But I was able to do that just as a, an individual. And that ended up being a really good choice. Our only criticism of the Anaheim Hotel on our previous stays and amongst some people in our group on this day is the air conditioning. We have actually, I am not a complainer very much. Like if I order a product, I, I rarely return it if I don't like it. If I'm at a restaurant and I don't like something I've been served, I will still usually eat it. Um, and so the same is true for hotels. I, I rarely will say, that I want to move because I'm disappointed. But at the Anaheim Hotel in previous visits, I have said, hey, the air conditioning isn't working in here and I'm gonna need to move because I get very, very hot and I need the air conditioning to work. And so they've been able to move us to a room that worked. And this time we had some issues with that people in our group and they eventually ended up in rooms uh, that were good enough for them. So that's the only issue that we've had. But overall, the hotel itself is affordable and close by and has some nice perks to it. So that worked out. Not everybody in our group stayed there because the way Disneyland is laid out, every chain is nearby. So some people had like DVC points they wanted to use at Disneyland hotels, or they had points they wanted to use at a a chain hotel nearby. And that's all totally fine. But when we did group things like meeting for pizza one evening, everybody could come to the hotel and just be there and then go back to their different hotels it makes it so easy at Disneyland. So that was nice. Our group did come into all different airports, which is another interesting facet of Disneyland planning is that there isn't just one airport that everybody comes into. It's kind of nice because you can look at pricing to all the different ones. So normally we would come into John Wayne Airport and many people in our group did, but the price was so high that I started looking at other airports. So on this trip, I came into Long Beach Airport. It was my first time doing that. And for a comparison, John Wayne is about a 20-minute car ride from the airport to Disneyland area hotels. And Long Beach is about 30 minutes. So not much further. It was a very interesting experience because Long Beach, you get off and board the plane outside. So it has a very kind of European feel to it. It's also under massive construction right now. So it will be nice when it's done, I think. But right now it's just, uh, you know, it was is a great option for us given the pricing. A lot of people also do fly into LAX, which is further away. Depending on traffic, it can be like an hour ride um, to and from. But obviously it is a bigger port that lots of people will prefer just because that's where the flights from where they live will end up at. There are other airports that are nearby, like Burbank, and there's Orlando, Ontario International Airport, et-, et cetera. So there's a handful to choose from. And I think our group ended up flying into three of them. Um, I think in terms of transportation, I believe everyone just used rideshare to get to and from the airport to our hotel. The only reason you would need to rent a car, and this is going to be the case for a lot of people going to Southern California is if you want to go to places outside of Disneyland. But if Disneyland's your only focus, rideshare is very easy because you can just take it to the hotel and uh, and then call a ride and get back. That way you don't have to pay daily parking fees, which most hotels do charge. But if you want to venture out and go to other places, there are lots of things to do in Southern California. So one of my favorite things about Disneyland trips is that you can combine them with other 
other things. So in that case, you would want to rent a car. But I think our group mostly use rideshare to get to and from. In terms of dining, Disneyland, everything with Disneyland is, is so is so different or at least slightly different than Disney World. Sometimes it opens up. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's super competitive. Sometimes it's not. I did not personally book any dining for this trip because I was doing so many other components. But a lot of people in our group did book dining. And it was very convenient because you would have one person with their, they would just book like a group of six. And whoever wanted to come could come. Or over here, you know, somebody would say, hey, I've got a group of four over here. And you could just kind of join wherever there were openings if you didn't have a reservation on your own. So I appreciated other people doing that because I was definitely not thinking about the dining amongst all the other details. In terms of traveling this time of year, we were there over the long weekend, the Indigenous People's Day slash Columbus Day weekend. We purposely planned it because some people are tied to school schedules and that allowed them a little bit of time off um, without having to miss school or miss as much school. Um, It is a very busy time at Disney World, as many of you know, because fall breaks take place then. And so it's actually one of the busiest times I've ever been at Disney World was over that time period. And that's because the fall breaks are, you know, like spring break now. And Disneyland has not historically had those crowds, but this time they did. And so that was a big shock. We had uh, VIP tour guides, which I'll talk about more in a second. And they said it hasn't been this busy since Christmas. So it was a shock to them. They are not used to people coming this time of year. So I don't know if that will be sort of a routine thing for Disneyland now. Like they're going to be affected by the fall breaks and people showing up. But it certainly was busy. It was also very hot. And that is not something that I was expecting. It was definitely above average. The temperatures were like 95 degrees. And normally Disneyland is much more mild than that. Only nice thing about it is that even when Disneyland is hot midday, the mornings and evenings are usually really nice. So if you really want to avoid the peak heat, you can just avoid the sort of midday touring in the parks. It is hard at Disneyland because so much of the parks and just, you know, Southern California in general is built around being outside. So the queues aren't necessarily inside an air conditioned Uh, The air conditioning doesn't necessarily keep up because it's not used to, you know, having prolonged periods of heat. So 95 can feel extra hot because um, it's not really built for those sort of extreme temperatures. On the other hand, it's not as humid. So that helps as well. But anyway, the heat was a big surprise. It did cool off a little bit towards uh, the like the last full day of our trip or so. And we definitely lived it up in the evenings and the mornings knowing that the midday was going to be so hot. So it was extremely busy. An extremely hot, big surprise, but um, we were able to sort of plan around it. And one of the ways that we got around the crowds was because we did have VIP tour guides. So on the Saturday of the weekend that we were there, 30 of the 34 people in our group went on VIP tours, which meant that we had three guides. And it's very interesting to me as a primarily Disney World person to do things that are in the same company, but are done so differently. And one of those is VIP tours. I could, I swear I could do a whole chart just comparing the two. But a couple of key differences between booking a VIP tour at Disneyland versus Disney World is that, first of all, Disneyland, you can book it way in advance, way in advance. Like I booked ours, I think, eight months ahead or something, some big number like that. Disney World, it is the same, you know, booking times as everything else, I believe. So 60 days out. So I was glad because I thought it might be a busy weekend, I was glad to be able to get three guides secured way in advance so I didn't have to worry about it. So that's one big difference. Another big difference, and this is this is a good one for Disneyland, is that they will get your reserve seating at parades and fireworks, even if your tour isn't taking place during the parade or fireworks, which is huge. So for instance, if Um, When I've done Disney World before, I made sure that the tour ended at Magic Kingdom at fireworks time so that they could put us in the VIP viewing for fireworks. So I would just count back like, okay, minimum seven hours, fireworks are at nine, let's start our tour at two, and that way we can get reserved viewing. But at Disneyland, they don't care about that. 
So our tour at Disneyland was from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then they had reserved parade viewing for us at 630. And they had reserved fireworks viewing at like whatever time it was, 9 or 930. And all you have to do is check in and give your name and you go in. And that's a big deal because you're really extending the length of your VIP perks beyond just the touring itself. And so that was really, really nice. And I ended up loving that we had the VIP tour because the parks were so crowded and it allowed, especially the first timers in our group, but obviously all of us that were on the tour to go on all the attractions without too much pressure navigating the crowds. It is helpful to be able to give VIP tour guides a list of attractions that you want to do and they will kind of just tell you what you can fit into the time and, you know, navigate you as you go. I will say that um, it's really obvious that you want to do things like the Indiana Jones, Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, some of the the main attractions, but I also wouldn't skip out on the dark rides. Disneyland dark rides are kind of all in a row, like Peter Pan and Alice and all these in a, in a row. And the VIP tour guides get you right on. And it's just the, the way the way that you enter is is like right before boarding. And so you can kind of get through several all in a row. And they're really charming. And uh, definitely wouldn't skip out on those if you just happen to be doing a VIP tour or not. Either way, they're they're very cute. And some of them are similar to Disney World. Some of them are unique to Disneyland. And so anyway, we ended up doing all these different ones. One ride that I was hesitant to put on the list because I wasn't sure if it was worth it for a Disney World group is Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. I, for instance, I had left off all of Galaxy's Edge from our touring because it is like almost identical. So I didn't think it was a good use of our time. But I did decide to put Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway on the list because the queue is so different. And I wanted a chance to kind of go through that and ride together. Of course, I could have done that on it my own time, but I wanted to make sure everyone had a chance to. And I was so glad that that we did that because it is very, very different in California. And it it looks a lot like walking through Hollywood and Vine Restaurant as opposed to the Chinese Theater in, in Florida. So that was really fun to be able to do that. And then we headed over to Cal- California Adventure. We ran into Jojo Siwa on the way. She is there a lot. So a lot of people get to see her at Disneyland. But she was hanging out with friends uh, as we made our way over to California Adventure. We came across her. So then once we got to California Adventure, we did lots of or a handful of different things before calling it a day. And that was super helpful. And then, like I said, that evening, we had the reserve viewing for the parade at Disneyland as well as the fireworks. And so that was really nice. The night before, many of us had done the World of Color dessert party. So World of Color is at California Adventure. And between the dessert party and the reserve viewing for the VIP tours, we kind of got all the nighttime things done fairly easily. The way that the fireworks or dessert party works at California Adventure is different than at Magic Kingdom. They bring you your plate already plated. Like everyone gets the same plate. It's not a buffet like you do at Magic Kingdom. And then everyone gets up to two alcoholic drinks and then some other, you know, like soft drinks, water, et cetera. So At one point, our table, I think, had 12 drinks on it between four people. And while you eat and drink, you view World of Color from your seat. So it all happens kind of at once. It's very quick and efficient and all of that, but just a, a different vibe when you have servers that are kind of quickly trying to bring all your stuff before the show starts. World of Color is has a different version going right now. So over the years, I've seen a few different versions and I enjoy them all. And that's a lot of fun at uh, California Adventure. So between the two things, we got to see the the nighttime entertainment in a pretty convenient way. Um, Sunday was Oogie Boogie Bash. And I think everybody in our group ended up going to that. Getting tickets isn't hard. It was not easy. If any of you follow like news kind of things online or discussions online when those tickets went on sale in true Disney form, it was very difficult and there were glitches. And so we had, you know, a few different members of our group that were able to get through, were able to get like, you know, big batches of tickets so that everybody was covered. And we went, we had a Pixar themed uh, costume for our group. So most people did like t-shirts of whatever character they were assigned. And uh, some of us did like all out costumes, which were tricky to pack and 
wear throughout the parks, but it was fun to have flexibility to do whatever you're comfortable with. So we got a group shot and then we kind of dispersed into smaller groups to do Oogie Boogie Bash. Um, Heather said this and I, I agree with her, which is Oogie Boogie Bash feels like the adult version of Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween Party. So the parade itself is very similar to Boo Parade in Florida. You would recognize some of the floats as being almost identical. But California Adventure in general just has a more adult feel to it. And so it did feel like a Halloween party for adults. We ended up doing a lot of rides because we could walk onto them. And these were either things that we did during the day in the VIP tour that we wanted to do at night, or they are things we didn't get to do previously that we wanted to make sure we got to do. So we ended up just kind of walking around to different rides and doing those. But there's a lot of exclusive entertainment that is takes place during the party. So it was a lot of fun. And definitely, like if you're an adult that happens to like Disney Halloween, I would definitely check into Oogie Boogie Bash if you are interested. And that was that was a really fun vibe. And then um basically the next day was Monday, the then a holiday that a lot of people had off. And that was just lots of small groups kind of doing some touring and, uh, you know, just kind of tying up the loose ends of things they hadn't done before or repeating things, maybe doing some shopping. I mean, there was a lot of people. So I don't know what everyone was up to, but that was how we had spent that day. And this day was much nicer than the previous days had been. So it ended up being a great way to end the trip. So overall, um, I would say mission accomplished, convincing the Disneyland first timers to try Disneyland. And many of them said, like, you did it. You converted me. I'm in. So that that felt good in the end. And we had a good trip. A lot of logistics to figure out with a group. But um, it worked out really well for us. So that was kind of it for Disneyland. I know this is primarily a Disney World focus podcast, but we obviously have trip reports from all the things that are kind of related because I know a lot of people have been looking at different options because many people want to try new things or don't really want to mess with the complications of Disney World. And so they want to try maybe Disney Cruise or parks, other parks. And so hopefully this has been helpful if you have been considering Disneyland. I think that will wrap up this episode of WW Prep to Go. For more information, you can always check the information in the show notes of your podcast app or head to the website www.prepschool.com. Click on podcast at the top and scroll down to episode 380. Until next time, I will see you on the site. <laughs> <laughs>